Welcome to Gospel Truth with Andrew Womack, celebrating 50 years of sharing God's unconditional love and grace. And now, Andrew continues teaching from the life-changing Word of God from the book of Proverbs. Welcome to our Friday's broadcast of the Gospel Truth. Today, I'm continuing to teach verse by verse through the book of Proverbs, and we're now up to Proverbs chapter 5 and verse 21. Let me just go back and say that in Proverbs chapter 5, of course, the whole book of Proverbs up until this time is, is extolling the wisdom, the knowledge, the understanding of God as being the key to everything and seeking God. And then in chapter 5, he's talking about that if we would embrace the words of God, it would keep us from the adulterous woman. And it talked about all of the terrible things that would happen. Our health would be destroyed. Our wealth would be gone. Our honor would be taken away. We would live under the bondage of cruel man. We would have to serve other people and um, all of these things. And it's, so it was talking about this adulterous woman, and it's not limited to just women. It's talking about adultery with a man or a woman. Let me go back and read verse 20. I covered this yesterday. It says in verse 20, And why wilt thou, my son, be ravished with a strange woman, that's talking about an adulterous woman, and embrace the bosom of a stranger? And then verse 21 gives you the reason why, if you were thinking properly, why you would never, ever go commit adultery. It says in verse 21, for, the word for is a conjunction. This is linking it to the previous verse. It's giving you the answer to the question. For the ways of man are before the eyes of the Lord, and he pondereth all his goings. You know why you don't go commit adultery? Because God is watching you. And it's a sin against God. Man, this is so powerful. You know, let me share this passage of Scripture. This is talking about uh, Joseph. In Genesis chapter 39, he was sold into slavery, and he was in the house of Potiphar, and Potiphar's wife wanted to have sexual relationship with Joseph, and Joseph avoided her, which is exactly what these verses I've been using uh, were saying. It says, don't even pass by her house. Don't go her way. You should avoid this. He avoided contact with her, but finally she just cornered him, and Joseph was so intent on getting out of there, he just ran and uh, ran out of there, and she went ahead and lied about him and said that he had raped her and put him into prison because of it. But when she was talking to him and trying to entice Joseph, this is in Genesis chapter 39, he says, how can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? Now that is a great point. You know, it would have been accurate if he would have said, how could I do this great witness and sin against Potiphar, the woman's husband, who was his master, who had honored him and exalted him and given him this high position, that would have been bad enough. But the thing that kept Joseph straight was he says, how could I do this great wickedness and sin against God? Did you know there are many people that just have situational ethics and they only live holy when they know that they're going to be held accountable. Like for instance, when I got drafted and sent to Vietnam, I went to Vietnam with a man that I grew up with. We had known each other. We weren't best friends, but we were friends. We had known each other our entire lives. We were both in Vietnam together and stuff, and we were only a few miles apart from each other. And anyway, this guy to this day is totally shell-shocked. He still dresses in his Vietnam gear, wears his boonie hat and all these kind of things, and his whole life was all messed up. And there's multiple things that happened. He was in some serious fighting and stuff. But you know, this guy was raised in the same church. We had the same friends. I knew his parents. He knew my parents and everything. And in the United States, he would have never lived the way he lived in Vietnam. I mean, there was adultery involved. The government would bring in these prostitutes and they were called showgirls and they'd put on a show, but they were all prostitutes and they'd give you all the free booze and you could have all the sex that you wanted for three days and stuff. And this guy succumbed to that. And he was involved in the drinking and in the drugs and in the sex and in all of this stuff. He would have never have done this back in the States. I knew him. We were friends. But here's the rationale. He was over on the other side of the world. He might not live. So it's not like it was ever going to get back. It wasn't going to be a reflection on his parents. 
Who would know? Everybody else was doing it. And he just succumbed to the pressure. You know, I was in the exact same situation, and yet I didn't succumb. And the reason is exactly like it states in Genesis chapter 39. Joseph said, how could I do this great wickedness and sin against God? Even though I could have gone and done drugs, I could have drank, I could have had all of this sex, I could have done all of these things. Did you know God was with me? And because I had an awareness of God and because I had a commitment to God and because I loved God, I wouldn't do it. I don't care if you paid me. I don't care if everybody else is doing it. I had a relationship with God. And this is what these verses are saying. In verse 20, why will thou, my son, be ravished with the strange woman? Why would that ever happen? Here's the answer in verse 21, because they don't understand that the ways of man are before the eyes of the Lord, and he pondereth all those goings. You aren't thinking properly. If you would think about God and that someday you're going to stand and give an answer for what you've done, and is this, is, what, is this what God created you to do? If you were to think like that, you wouldn't live that lifestyle. Boy, this is important. You know, God is speaking to you through me today. There are many people, I believe, all over the world that you are living a lifestyle that this world says is just fine. Everything's fine. You don't have to be married. You don't have to be committed. It doesn't even have to be a person of the opposite sex. You just do whatever. Live like an animal. It's just up to you. Everything's fine. But in your heart, you know differently. And as you're listening to me and as you're thinking about someday you're going to have to stand before God, and He's going to ask you what you did. If you would think about it, you would change the life that you're living. You can do it right now. There is mercy from God. I'm not preaching that God hates you. I'm saying that God loves you. He made you for something more than this. He doesn't want you to live like a dog or like a cat. You're created in His image. God's got something better for you. Man, that's awesome. In verse 22, it says, His own iniquity shall take the wicked himself, and he shall be holden with the cords of his sin. You know, this is comparing sin to being like a trap. The Bible says over in Hebrews chapter 11 that there is pleasure in sin for a season, but it's a trap. It's a bait. Satan may lure you with this adulterous relationship, but it's a trap. And I guarantee you, you will be taken and holding with the cords of your very own sin. You shall die without instruction. In the greatness of his folly, he shall go astray. Who wants to live like that? You know, if you would think about it, I know that in your heart, you know that the way you're living isn't correct. You need to change it. You need to stop. I don't care what this world is saying. This is the wisdom of God. And if you would start basing your life on the truth of God's Word instead of the lies and the deception that this world is putting out, you would be much happier. Man, things would work so much better. So in Proverbs chapter 6, verse 1, it now moves on to some other matters. And this is beginning to talk about being a guarantor for somebody else's debt. In verse 1, it says, My son, if thou be surety for thy friend, if thou hast stricken thine hand with a stranger, in other words, talking about shaking hands and guaranteeing somebody's debt. It says, Thou art snared with the words of thy mouth. Thou art taken with the words of thy mouth. In other words, this is snared. This is talking about you've been trapped. This, in other words, is saying, Do not guarantee other people's debt. Now, I can't say that this is just forbidding that it being done. Because if you were to study the book of Philemon, I'm not going to take time to turn over there. Some people pronounce it Philemon. But if you go over there, the book right before uh, Hebrews, it's only one chapter. You'll find out that Paul was interceding for Onesimus, who is a slave who had run away from Philemon and he had wound up in Rome and he had made contact with Paul, probably because Paul had met him before at uh, Philemon's house. And uh, anyway, he got born again. And so Paul is now saying that I'm sending him back to you, which this shows a lot about Onesimus. He was truly converted because he was going back to a master that he had run away. He was a slave. He had run away. He could have been put to death or at the very least flogged or punished for this. But you know what? He was going to do what was right, even if it cost him his life. And Paul wrote the letter 
to Philemon to intercede for him. And he said, if he's stolen anything from you or if he owes you anything in back wages, he says, put that on my account. I will vouch for him. I will pay his debt. So in a sense, you know what Paul was doing? Paul was doing the opposite of what Proverbs chapter 6 is saying right here, where it says, don't be a surety for a friend. Don't strike hands. Don't guarantee their debt. And yet Paul did it. So I, as you put these two things together, I think here's the way that you probably have to look at it, is that don't do it unless you are absolutely certain that the person you're vouching for is trustworthy. If you vouch for uh, a person and you are exposing yourself to their debt, you're taking on their debt. And it's just not a wise thing to do. I don't know that this is saying you can't do it. It's saying it's not wise to do it. Personally, based on these scriptures right here, I have intentionally refused to vouch for some people who I think that probably were worthy of it, but I just am so hesitant about it. It's, it's not wisdom. You are making yourself, you're exposing yourself. You're making yourself vulnerable based on somebody else's integrity. It's hard enough to control your own integrity, much less somebody else's. And so it's just not a wise practice. And it says, if you have done it, you are snared with the words of your mouth. And here's what you do in verse 3. It says, do this now, my son, and deliver thyself when thou art come into the hand of thy friend. Go humble thyself and make sure thy friend. Give not sleep to thine eyes, nor slumber to thine eyelids. Deliver thyself as a roe from the hand of the hunter, as a bird from the hand of the fowler. In other words, this is saying that if you have made a guarantee for somebody else, here's what you should do. Go and beg them to let you out of this contract. Get out of it if at all possible. It says don't sleep until you've taken care of the situation. And in verse 5 it says, look at it as like you are a a deer that's been trapped. You're fixing to be killed. Get out of this situation if, if at all possible. Now again, I don't believe that this is absolutely forbidding it. It's just showing you the dangers of guaranteeing somebody else's debt. But if you find yourself in this situation, get out of it just as quickly as you possibly can. And notice also over here in the uh, second verse, it says, you are snared with the words of your mouth. You are taken with the words of thy mouth. This is an attitude that goes contrary to our society today. People today just say all kinds of things. They'll promise anything, and they don't even mean it. And people don't hold to their words, but that is an ungodly way of thinking. Psalms chapter 15 verse 4 says, A godly man will swear to his own hurt and change not. If you're the kind that just promises things, oh, I'll be there at 5 o'clock and you don't get there until 5.30. Oh, I promise you I'll do this and then you don't do it. You're an ungodly person. I'm not saying that to hurt anybody. I'm just saying that's not like God. God cannot lie. God never misrepresents anything. God never promises anything He can't deliver on. And if you do, then you aren't godly. So the Bible is saying that you're snared by the words of your mouth. You need to watch what you say. You, this is the right attitude. The attitude of this world is just promise anything. And even if you have a contract, if you've got a good lawyer, you can break a contract. You can get out of it. It's ne there is no such thing as an ironclad contract. That's the way the world talks. But a godly person will say something, and if they tell you they're going to be there at 7 o'clock, they'll be there at 7 o'clock. Matter of fact, I tell the people I travel with, if you aren't five minutes early, you're late. If we say we're going to leave at 10 o'clock, you better be there at 9.55 so that we can leave at exactly 10 o'clock. I think that that's a godly attitude. If you don't have that attitude, you're snared by the words of your mouth. You are, you are not telling the truth. This isn't the right way to live. In verse 6, it says, Go to the ant, thou sluggard. Consider her ways and be wise. I think this is amusing. That you know what? There are people that could learn lessons from animals. Animals, they don't get sidetracked the way that people do. Man, you know, animals are basically just exactly the way God made them to be. Now, since the fall, there is some perversion and not everything works perfectly. But on a whole, you know what? Animals fulfill their calling much better than people do. Animals aren't lazy the way that people are. Animals don't go out and 
do the things that people do. They don't hurt themselves. Man, it's just amazing. You know, I saw some pictures just recently of, you know, they were talking about gay marriage, how that people are now saying that I feel like a woman and so it's okay for us to marry just because of their feelings, because they just feel this way. They, they ignore the plumbing that God gave them and they just go by however they feel. And that has opened up the door to now they have these things. I saw pictures of a guy who had over, I think, 20-something operations to make him look like a cat. He felt like a cat, and so he's changed his face. He's got big fangs, and he's tattooed, and he looked like a cat. I just read that they had a convention that there, there were over 3,000 people that showed up at this convention dressed like dogs and cats, wearing costumes and assuming the persona of a dog and a cat. And 3,000 people had this convention where they met together, and they have a name for it, I forgot what it is, but they, they say that this is who they really are. They aren't people, they're cats. And they, they go around on all fours, they bark, they meow. That's just stupid. It is stupid. And it's just as stupid for a person to say that I'm a woman when you've got the plumbing of a man. It's just wrong. It's stupid. You don't do these kind of things. We ought to learn some things from animals. You know what? Dogs are dogs. Cats are cats. They, aren't, they don't try and act like the other one. They don't try and be something that they aren't. And so he says, Go to the ant, thou sluggard, and consider her ways. You know, ants, it's amazing. The intuitive knowledge that God has built into not just ants, but anything. You know, bumblebees and birds. There are birds that migrate thousands of miles and come back to the place where they were hatched. How do they know this? How do they know how to navigate? How do they instinctively know how to raise their, uh, you know, offsprings? I believe that God just put this on the inside of them. It's not weird or spooky. It's just God created this knowledge in ants, in birds, in all kinds of animals. And if you can see this in the animal creation, then I can guarantee you that God put this knowledge on the inside of people. You know better. People that are out living these lives of perversion, they know better. There is this instinct. There's this intuitive knowledge on the inside. It is demonic deception that draws people into these perverted lifestyles. Man, we could learn a lot if we'd just go to the ant, if we'd just look at creation and see how some things work. In verse 7, it says, talking about the ants, which having no guide, overseer, or ruler, provideth her meat in the summer and gathereth her food in the harvest. This is just amazing how that, you know, without any of the verbal communication that we're aware of, I have read some uh, research where ants and bees and things like this do communicate through dances and through some type of things, but it's not communication the way we know. And yet they can operate in perfect harmony. They are assigned, you know, there are worker ants, there are digger ants, there are soldier ants, and they, the soldier ants don't try and be the uh, nursemaids to the, you know, the queen ant or whatever. They, they assume their role and they just stay there and they assign and they are totally focused on it. We could learn things by this. God has just intuitively put this in it, in them. They provide, they work hard all through the summer that, so that in the winter when there isn't the abundance of food and stuff, they have all this food piled up. Man, we could learn something from that. There are people that are just wasting their time. They aren't thinking about the future. They aren't making provision for their old age or even for the next winter. There are people that'll get a car and instead of ever thinking that this car is eventually going to have to have the oil changed, this car is going to have to have tires, they will just go out and blow all of their money and not provide for anything. You aren't as smart as an ant. An ant has more brains than that. Amen. I know some people think, man, you're being very hard. I'm just trying to counter this foolishness, the insanity that's in our culture. And the Word of God makes these things very clear. There are people that think, boy, you're strange. I don't think I'm strange at all. I think that the people who are living out here in all the perversion and spending millions of dollars and doing all of these weird things and having conventions where people dress up as dogs and cats, I think that's weird. 
I think people that marry a person of the same sex, I think that's weird. I think people that commit adultery, that's weird. That's not normal. I don't care who they are and how rich they are and how much um, acclaim they have from people. In the sight of God, which is the only sight that counts, that's weird. In verse 9, it says, How long wilt thou sleep, O sluggard? When wilt thou arise out of thy sleep? Yet a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to sleep. So shall thy poverty come as one that travaileth, and thy want as an armed man. You know, this is extolling the virtue of work, and it is shaming people who won't work and who are sluggards and just want everybody to hand things to them. A New Testament counterpart to this is 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, where it says, if you don't work, don't eat. Did you know that this right here should guide our welfare system? Now, there's people that get into trouble and need help, and I'm aware of that. Anybody could ha fall on bad times, but to just give them money for doing nothing is wrong. That is an ungodly principle. It goes against everything said right here. You are not supposed to reward laziness, sluggardness. And you know, there are people that make a living off of praying, off of good, moral people who go out and work hard, and they just pray on this. You know, recently I, well, I better not say that. I was going to say something political, but I don't have enough time to explain it, so I'm not going to open up that can of worms if I can't deal with it. But there are people that are just promoting that, you know, recently they came out in Europe and they actually made a proposal to give every single person in the country something like $3,000, $3,500, and even children got a certain amount. Whether you worked, whether you did anything, it was just going to be the government that paid this. And praise God, they voted that down. That is unsustainable. You cannot do that. That is against everything that the Word of God teaches. Welfare that is just total free money, not attached to you doing something to get better and to do something in return for it, is an ungodly, unscriptural concept. And if we believe that, if we took the Word of God and believe this, it would change our entire welfare system. It would change the whole course of this nation, and it needs to change. We're out of time today, but I am going to continue this. Next week, we're going to continue to teach verse by verse through the book of Proverbs. And I tell you, there's some powerful things here that could really bless you. We trust you're growing in wisdom as you study along with Andrew through the book of Proverbs. You can get the entire series that covers all 31 chapters of Proverbs in a CD or DVD album for $75 when you contact us. If you'd like to enhance your study, make sure to get a copy of Andrew's brand new hardcover book on Proverbs that includes all of his personal study notes and commentary on hundreds of verses. This book is available for $40. Or, if you prefer, you can get this book in the Proverbs gift box, which also includes a leather-bound journal as well as a pen, so you can chronicle your journey as you study through Proverbs with Andrew. I am really excited to share with you something that we've never done before. This is an 800-page book that I've put out studying verse by verse through the book of Proverbs. And this is a whole set that goes along with it. We've got this little uh, cover right here that says Proverbs, Timeless Teaching for a Life of Blessing. And then we've got this little notepad that goes with it. All of this was engraved by my son that was raised from the dead. This Proverbs gift box is a limited time offer and is a great idea for friends or family. Order it today for only $65 while supplies last. If you'd like to receive all of Andrew's available resources on Proverbs, make sure to order the Proverbs package. This package includes the entire Proverbs teaching in both CD and DVD albums. All of the items in the Proverbs gift box, including the book, journal, and pen, and the Proverbs software on a USB drive for your Windows computer. The special USB drive contains the Proverbs portion from the Living Commentary with all of Andrew's personal study notes on the entire book of Proverbs in digital form. This package has a catalog value of $235, but you can get it for just $199. Contact us to order the Proverbs package today. 
Go to awmi.net to see all the ways you can get these products. While there, you can discover other products and download many free resources. Or call our helpline Monday through Friday from 4.30 a.m. to 9.30 p.m. Mountain Time. Our helpline number is 719-635-1111. To write us, use the address on your screen. We appreciate your generosity and hope to hear from you today. Okay, this is our construction update. We are once again in the auditorium part of our phase two construction, and we are actually standing above the highest seat in the balcony. So the highest seat in the balcony will be below us, and they put all of this scaffolding up so that they could work on the ceiling. They've now got all the HVAC in here, and they've got a lot of electrical stuff done, and a lot of the outlets. These white things here, these are what they're calling clouds. And there's multiple purposes for this. One of them is that the lights will hang down below these clouds. And so when the light is shining in here, you won't be able to see up above. Everything is black and uh, it'll look like these clouds are the ceiling. But one of the main things is it's for the acoustical thing and it will help the sound in here. They also told me they're going to start putting up some of the wood columns and things that go up here. So the grand total to get everything finished is $6,619,995. At that rate, we've been uh, dedicating $550,000 a month to this. That means that we would be in this building November to December 2018. I am really believing that we could shorten this by at least three or four months so that we could get in here by the start of the 2018-2019 school year. So we'll give you another update in a month, but I just wanted to let you know that, praise God, we're making great progress. Thanks to those of you who've been a part of this, I tell you, people's lives are being changed. So God bless you. We'll give you another update in about a month. Do you want to connect with like-minded believers? Do you want to go deeper in God's Word through the teachings of Andrew Womack? Do you believe God has more? Then Karis Bible Studies is the place for you. Connect with believers in your area to dig into the message of God's unconditional love and grace. You will be encouraged to grow with a small group of believers as you study the Word and fellowship. The leaders are Karis alumni with a solid foundation in the Word of God. They have embraced Jesus' command to make disciples of all nations, even those in their backyard. Karis Bible Studies are connecting believers with the Word of God in your neighborhood. Find a Bible study near you by visiting karisbiblestudies.net.